Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Problems in Latinx Representation and Storytelling. I'm pleased to be joined by Christopher Gonzalez. He's a professor of English and the director of the Latinx Cultural Center at Utah State University. Uh, today is October the 21st. My name is Andy Mink. I am the Vice President for Education Programs at the Center. And on behalf of Jira and Mike and Meredith, uh, my education team at the Center, we want to welcome you back to the, uh, to the program. Uh, thank you for joining us for another episode. I see many familiar faces and names uh, scattered across the country who have joined us. In particular, I want to thank Ricky for joining us. Ricky's joining us from uh, Enrico County, just outside of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Matthew, who's in San Carlos School District in the southern part of San Francisco. Uh, Andrea, who's at Shenandoah University. And as always, our LA contingent is well represented. Uh, welcome tonight, Jovita and Martha Figueroa and Jonathan Gomez. In particular, my last uh, roll call shout out is going to go to Cassie. Cassie's joining us from Ecuador tonight. And Cassie, I think you've got the um, the notation as being probably our farthest away geographically, although, of course, in this digital format, uh, space and distance doesn't matter quite as much. One of the things that I hear in terms of the themes of our fellows as they come to the center, annual group of scholars and humanists and professors who are selected based on project ideas to come to the center, do their research, do their writing, have this kind of unencumbered space to really fully explore the many dimensions of the work that they do. One common theme, though, that seems to run through all of the humanities disciplines that are represented from all of the professors who come from many different universities all across the country is this notion of identifying identity and the way that identity is represented, whether that's in antiquity and in the past, whether it's present, whether it's through art or music or literature or literary uh, studies or historical records or curriculum. You know, how, how do we represent and how do we uh, pay attention to uh, the various voices of identity, both ours individually, ours as a group and a community, and maybe most importantly, how we can relate to each other once that identity is well understood. Um, I'm really pleased that um, uh, just in terms of the values work we do in education, that we often try to mimic that and mirror that and give you access to those thoughts around uh, this notion of identity and the ways that we can accurately and fairly represent uh, the, the many different uh, identities in our communities. We've got a lot of resources that also then connect us with your classroom. I hope that you do take some time to explore the Humanities of Class Digital Library to find those resources. These resources are free and they're open. You can always count on them as being available, being uh, of high quality and scholarly vetted. They're also, they all come with a Creative Commons license of uh, non-commercials. So you can use them in your classroom, you can share them, you can disseminate them, you can embed them in lessons, and we encourage you to do just that. As a matter of fact, I uh, also hope that you have a chance to either review, either preview or review the readings that Professor Gonzalez has shared with us for tonight. You can find these in that same digital library in the webinar series group. Uh, we've tagged uh, the readings that were provided. This is also where I'll put the PowerPoint at the conclusion of tonight's session, and we'll also put the recordings of tonight's session for you to go back, maybe spend some more time with, or um, you know, sort of chew over them and see how you can uh, use it to affect and impact your instruction. If these kinds of topics are interesting to you, I hope you also consider joining us for future webinars this year. Uh, we have uh, these four in particular that I think um, directly address this notion of representation and identity. Uh, as we have announced, and I hope that uh, you've gotten word, the session with Iana Thompson from Arizona State has been rescheduled from November 4th to November 30th. She'll be working with us on decolonizing the Shakespeare curriculum. And then in the new year, Marianne Rett from Monmouth University will be discussing how Islam is portrayed in comics. Matthew Garcia, who's at Dartmouth, I'm sorry, that should say Dartmouth College, not university. Uh, Matthew Garcia, Professor Garcia, will uh, provide an historical context and, and deep understanding of uh, Cesar Chavez and the farm workers movement. And then finally, Cristina Villarreal uh, at the University of Texas at El Paso will be working with us on how to understand the U.S. history narrative through Latin American perspectives. Uh, please do uh, consider signing up and share these with your colleagues and your departments. I do have uh, teachers who assign webinars to their students as well. So if you've got older students you think would enjoy the conversation and you'd like to add that as a part of um, a formative exercise or perhaps some 
flipped classroom activity where they attend the webinar and you discuss it the next day. We are more than welcome, uh, more than happy to welcome your students. And if you do that, please let me know in advance. And if you have questions they would like to submit, I'll bump those to the front of the queue and make sure that they're directly addressed. All of our work is informed by our Teacher Advisory Council. I want to thank these 21 expert scholars and educators for their uh, continued hard work on our behalf. Uh, you know, this year is very, very disruptive, and I'm very conscious about not adding more to teachers' plates than uh, is relevant and useful. These folks help us do that, and I want to thank them for their continued uh, support. Tonight's session, uh, although you will only hear our voices and see the PowerPoint screen, is intended to be very interactive, and I encourage all of you to use the audience chat box to share ideas and thoughts, respond to questions if we pose them, chatter at each other, uh, crack jokes if your name is U Ulysses. Um, we really want to see that to be a vibrant and active conversation space. But if you have a formal question that you'd like to bring to Professor Gonzalez, please add it to the Ask the Professor tab, and that'll come directly to me as the moderator. And at the appropriate time, I'll pause and we'll clarify some thoughts. Uh, I'll bring those to the professor's attention and we'll be sure to address them. So again, you have joined the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled Problems in Latinx Representation and Storytelling. I'm joined by Christopher Gonzalez, professor of English and the director of the Latinx Cultural Center at Utah State University. Hey, Chris, can you hear me over on the, uh, the western part of the country? Uh, I can. Can you hear me? Uh, sure can. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, your voice sounds strong and, and, um, and we can hear you just fine. Um, in a moment, I'm going to give you control of the PowerPoint and ask you to lead this conversation. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to be bringing questions to you on occasion as the moderator, but I'd actually like to start with my own question, if you don't mind, just to, to sort of frame where I think this conversation might go. Um, and if you, if you don't mind, it's going to be a little bit personal and direct. Um, I talked some about identity in the opening uh, introduction and the welcome, um, this notion of, of who we are and how we relate to others. And it seems to me that identity is formed particularly for young people in lots of places. We've got teachers with us tonight who teach kids as early as elementary school, all the way up through high school and college. And you know, we're constantly being, um, being given these mirrors, including TV and media, that allow us to see what others think our identity might be. Do you remember personally when you got a strong sense of your own identity? When, when did Chris Gonzalez sort of understand who he was in that sense? Well, I understood myself through my family. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that holds true for many people. Um, in particular for me, um, I was aware of my identity by omission. So that is to say, I came to understand how how I and how my family were different than the people, the families, the characters that I saw on television and in film. Uh, and in particular, I always always go back to this formative story for me, as it was for a lot of people in my generation, uh, Star Wars. Um, yeah. I, I was I was I was moved. You know, uh, by by that film and by the first three films in in in, in such profound ways, and I was I, and that's where I became keenly aware that I could never be Luke Skywalker because Luke Skywalker doesn't look like me. Um, and th this is something that I'll, I'll talk about you know later, but um, there is no reason why Luke Skywalker should be blonde and blue eyed. Um, and look like he's of European descent within the story world. Uh, he comes from another planet, <laughs> right? So um, I, I don't understand that now, but at the time I couldn't understand why, why, why are people like uh, the people I live with, the people who I am friends with, why do they not appear in these, in these particular stories? So, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so I became aware of my identity uh, through not only the con close contact I had with my own culture, but, but because I did not see my culture elsewhere. Right. Uh, it's funny, last year we did a webinar with uh, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, who's a, just a wonderful uh, education scholar at University of Pennsylvania. And the topic was the dark fantastic and the representation of race in science fiction and, and youth fantasy. And she shared with us, I did not know this until that webinar, that when 
J.K. Rowling originally wrote the Harry Potter series, that she imagined Hermione, one of the three main characters, the young girl, as being African-American. But in the ways that others interpreted that book, and then the ways, of course, it was represented on the big screen, et cetera, she became a, a, a white girl. So it's funny how that, that omission, it really is very, very clear. And I guess it happens in both directions. Yes, uh, I didn't know if you want me to, to respond to that. Um, I, I'll yeah. just briefly say that, um, you know, one of the things we have in mainstream storytelling is, is the kind of normalization of whiteness, that that becomes the default for mm -hmm. all characters, for all right. expressions of character. And within a story, um, uh, let's say a written story, uh, where, where the visual is not provided, um, it's, it's, it's really open to interpretation. But it is funny how, you know, most, most uh, I, would, I would venture to say many readers would read uh, a, a description of a character if it, if it doesn't mention skin or hair or eye color, they will likely default that that character is white. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so what I'm looking forward to tonight, and I suspect that this will be either in your presentation or in our conversation, um, I, I'm interested in ways that we can disrupt that default, particularly for our students in, in younger grades. So, Chris, again, thank you so much for joining. I'm going to turn things over to you now. And again, I'll be bringing questions to you on occasion. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andy, for this opportunity. Thank you for um, uh, coordinating such wonderful lectures. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this series. Uh, thank you to the National Humanities Center. Um, yes, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, the title of my talk is Problems in Latinx Representation and Storytelling. Um, titles are, are a difficult thing, um, especially in a talk that um, is going to be pretty expansive. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to dip into many different aspects of Latinx culture representation in the United States. Um, and so I, I, I basically went with problems, <laughs> um, not, not to suggest that these are necessarily uh, negative uh, in connotation, but that they are, um, they are issues that uh, present uh, uh, opportunities for us to resolve or to attempt to solve these um, uh, vexed aspects of identity, and in particular in storytelling. Um, so I will begin with a question. Um, it is a question that I've heard in some form um, uh, more and more as, as time goes on. Um, and the question is, why should anyone care about Latina, Latino, Latinx demographics uh, or that demographic in the United States? Like, like, why are we paying so much attention to it? Um, now, those of us who are a part of this demographic or, are, or we work in education, we, we already know the answer to this. But I think, it's, I think it's helpful to face this question head on because those of us who are doing this kind of work, um, we take it for granted in some ways, I think, that, that this is important work. But every once in a while and every so often, we will be confronted with someone who will ask us this question. And, and if we're not prepared for it, we may, um, we may be taken aback and surprised that the question even came about. So I wanted to start tonight with this question that for us seems obvious, but uh, for some people uh, actually is a question. And so my direct answer and the answer, at least one response that I would encourage all of you to adopt uh, is a very simple and straightforward one. And that is that the future of the United States is inexorably tied to what happens to the Latinx community. So in other words, the United States will rise or fall based on what happens to the Latinx community. Uh, we know this based on numbers, we, and I'm gonna go through numbers here in just a moment. Um, this, is, this is the most straightforward answer that we can uh, begin with. Uh, this, this may be a surprise to some. As I said, it is not a surprise to those of us who have been working uh, in this particular field. So um, I will uh, just lay out some numbers because sometimes numbers are a good foundation to begin with. 
Um, so some quick facts, this is easily found on the Pew Research Center. Many of you may be familiar with this. Um, if not, this is an opportunity for you to familiarize yourself with that uh, particular um, statistical entity. They do a lot of great work in crunching numbers and st statistical data. Uh, so we'll begin with the top here. 62.1 million Latinos were surveyed, right? That, that's the census, I should say, uh, from 2020. And that is a 23% increase over the last 10 years. That is, that is significant growth. And we know that that number has no, um, uh, uh, has no kind of terminus. It is not going to end anytime soon. The, the growth is happening now. It has been happening, it's happening now, it's going to continue happening. Um, and I think a lot of, when I'm speaking to educators, uh, I think mostly here, um, our, our schools and our universities are now, if they're not doing this now, they, they should be doing it. They have to come to terms with the fact that this growth is happening. Now, many, many of the educators here tonight are in California or Los Angeles, so I, you, you, you all definitely see um, the, the significant uh, uh, population and demographics uh, in the Latinx community there. Um, but that's almost expected. And in fact, for many years, that's been kind of the, you know, kind of what people understood in terms of, uh, well, Los Angeles, California, there are a lot of Latinos there, Texas, a lot of Latinos, Southwest. But there aren't those numbers, say, in the Midwest or uh, in the Intermountain West, where I am in Utah, or perhaps on the East Coast. Uh, that, is, that, that no longer holds. Uh, the numbers are going up everywhere, as, as we will see. So the growth is going up. Comp uh, Latinos comprise more than half of the entire US population growth over the last 10 years. So of all the growth, right, let's kind of reiterate this, of all of the growth that happened within 10 years, half of it is attributable to the Latinx uh, population. That is, that, is, um, that is not only highly significant, it is, it is eye-opening. Um, the majority, the heretofore majority demographic, the white demographic, is in decline. Um, there, was, there, there, was, there was no growth, and in fact, it actually uh, starts to, uh, seems to, to that, that line seems to be trending down. Right. Um, this is important when we're talking about higher education. Um, we see that universities uh, that were uh, and have been uh, in terms of tuition and student fees uh, and enrollment have been, um, you know, dependent on white male students. That number is going down and those universities are going to have to make um, they're going to have to make a paradigm shift. They're going to have to rethink how they recruit Latinx students and other non-white students because those numbers are going up, white numbers are going down. If you want to continue to have the enrollments or to grow enrollment at a university, this is where you're going to have to go. And many universities, including my own, recognize this and they're uh, uh, either putting into place or they're continuing programs to reach out to this particular demographic. So as an example, states like Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, as one might imagine, they all have the lowest overall percentage of Latinos. But by the same token, and as I said, you might expect that, but by the same token, those same states had the fastest increase of Latinos since 2010. So uh, it, it no longer holds that you can say, well, this is an issue that's really only California, it's the Southwest, it's Texas. It, this, is, this is a national issue. And that's why I begin with the question and the answer that this nation at, at, at all levels is going to have to have a reckoning with the Latinx community, uh, a community that has often been derided, that has been ignored, that has been disenfranchised. Now this nation will have to, uh, to, to change tack. It, it will have to recognize this particular demographic um, and, and, and begin to make inroads with, um, with this particular population um, in ways that it has not done before. 
So um, I, this is a good opportunity also to mention or to dispel the notion that all of this growth is happening due to immigration. So often, in particular, uh, right-wing media tends to portray uh, Latinos as, as you know, growing in number because of unchecked borders and the like. And that's not the case. Um, actually, Latinos in the United States are having families. They're having children. Um, newborns are driving the increase in population in this demographic. It is not immigration. Uh, immigration numbers are actually declining, which is a different conversation that we can't have tonight because that's not the, the focus here. Um, but, it, but it is a, an issue worth, um, worth examining and, and having a conversation about. Latinos who speak fluently, who speak English fluently, I should say, rose from 59 to 72%. So more and more Latinos are speaking English, which makes sense if many Latinos who are here in the United States are having children. Uh, those children are exposed more to English at schools, and oftentimes um, parents may not continue the tradition of speaking Spanish at, at home as each generation kind of comes around. There's that potential of losing that language or not being as proficient in it. So we're seeing that happen. And then we're also seeing that Latinos over 25 years old with college uh, experience has actually gone up. So they're now starting to um, make uh, entry into higher education. Uh, just a few more facts here before, before we go on. And I think this is important because it lays a foundation, it lays a numerical foundation so that um, when we have this conversation, we explore this topic, uh, this is not just my opinion, right? Um, so I'm grounding uh, the beginning of my talk in statistical um, numbers here. So four in five, that's 80% of Latinx's, Latinxs are US citizens. Again, that kind of runs counter to the narrative that we're always hearing in certain media and films perhaps, uh, in television, that um, the Latinxs that we have in the United States, when you encounter one, that there's a likelihood that they just recently arrived. And we now see that that's, that's probably less than a quarter of all Latinos uh, that, that that is applicable to. Uh, also, U.S. Latinxs who are immigrants are on decline. Uh, again, there, there, are, there are reasons for that. Um, uh, a lot of it has to do with policy, the, uh, the immigration laws, um, and, and other uh, national policies that are um, uh, directly affecting uh, immigrants from Latin America, uh, but this is this is what it is, right? Um, I think it's important to note that, and that it is important to note that because it also ties into how we are represented as a group. By we, I mean Latinx's, uh, how we are represented and how we appear in visual media in particular. Um, so it's just a, a, a beginning here, right? Um, you can, we can put it in a different way. Uh, Pew Research, you know, does a great job with their graphs. You can visually see where that line is trending. And we see that and we say, well, what are the implications of this? What, well, as I previewed before, uh, it's hard to see how uh, institutions and infrastructure and policies are not going to be shaped by these numbers. These demographic, you know, this demographic data is destiny. This is this is going to move things, uh, whether people like it or not. And I and I sense that there will there are people who do not like this trend. It makes them uncomfortable. It changes the status quo. It makes people have to think differently about their nation, about um, certain communities within that nation. And so it it, it is um, unsurprising that there is also a rise in hate groups. Uh, in particular, because of these numbers, right? So I give just two examples. I recently was uh, speaking with some folks at um, Virginia Commonwealth University, and I just showed just some of the things that are happening there and at my university, at at our at my university in uh, Utah State, uh, and here in Utah we have um, 
we have a governing body uh, called the Utah System for Higher Education. It's called, they call it UCHI. Um, and they identified what they call U U Utah's growing opportunity gap. And they mandated uh, that the universities under their purview uh, address this and that their student demographic reflect the changes that are happening in the state. Um, the statistics and the demographic data show that by 2065, it is predicted that the percent of people of color in Utah between the ages of 18 and 35 will almost double. Um, and again, if this is like the example I showed of Montana and the Dakotas, where you don't often think there are many Latinos here. But you also have to remember there aren't many people here, period, right? It's just like the, just the population of the state uh, is, is, is less, you know, significantly less than, say, Los Angeles, right? Um, but percentage-wise, it makes a huge difference when the state is now projected to double in its um, demographic that concerns people of color. Uh, Virginia is the same, right? So the Virginia Latino Advisory Board stated that by 2030, the number of Latinos in the state of Virginia would almost double, right? So we're looking at, you know, 2030, 2060, these states that are conceived of as not being, uh, having a high population of Latinos, they're, they're actually doubling and, and, they're, and they're having this growth, but they're also ill-prepared to handle that growth as things are right now. So um, these are the implications. This is, this is serious stuff. Um, and sometimes I think it's helpful to see this, uh, as, as I said, in statistical data so that um, it's kind of hard to run away from the argument. One may have a feeling or say, well, I think, but the other thing too, and I'll talk about this more as I go, um, this demographic data does not, is not reflected in the media that we consume. That is to say our film, our television, our streaming um, devices and, and streaming apps uh, in, our, in our publishing industries, that this is, this, is, this is the disparity that we see. And um, I think we're in the midst of a reckoning. And I think uh, Andy had mentioned earlier how what I talk about, what we talk about tonight can be applicable to change um, this, 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 this strange invisibility that Latinos tend to have in, in mass storytelling. So, um, with that out of the way, not that I, not that I dislike numbers, but I'm not a numbers person. I'm a humanities person, right? And yes, is someone chiming in? Uh, well, I did unmute myself, Chris, just as you're transitioning. I do have one question to bring to you before you move forward. Sure. Um, I apologize if I interrupted you with the, the mute button there. Um, do us a favor and clarify, uh, and Jeffrey, I appreciate your question. I'm going to modify it a little bit, uh, I think, but tell us a little bit about the evolution of the, the linguistical evolution of the term Latinx. Jeffrey, in his question, notes that Latino and Latina is used for most of uh, Latin American uh, communities and countries. Um, wh where did this come from, and, and what is, how do you see it sort of affecting or being important in the conversation that we're having? Yeah, Jeffrey, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, the first thing I should say is that the change to an X uh, is highly contentious. Uh, not everyone agrees with it, and that's and that's fine. It's a, it's a, it is a debate that is ongoing. Um, to to Jeffrey's point in particular, the reason this does not appear in Argentina and Spain and other Spanish-speaking countries is because as as many of us know, Spanish is a gendered language, right? Uh, there, there's a masculine and a feminine form. Uh, and, and that's the way it has been um, for centuries. And that is, that for some, that is the problem as well. But um, the problem that we're facing here are Latinxes in the United States, which, as I showed, um, a, great percentage of them are English speaking. They may be bilingual, but they're also speaking in English. And 
when we bring Latino and Latina into English, it becomes an English word. I know that's, that's, that's shocking for some people, but it now becomes an English word. And English does this all the time, right? There are loan words from other languages, and it now becomes a part of the English repertoire. When we say Latino in Spanish, we may mean a man, or we may mean the characteristic of being uh, Latino culture, right, or Hispanic culture. Uh, and there are, there, are, there are a group of people that feel excluded by that. Um, and in particular, women, right? So if I say Latinos, which I do often, sometimes, um, it, in English, it may sound like we're we are excluding women when that might be a mixed group, right? So there are linguistic challenges and problems. I will also note that, um, that this particular demographic has tried to reinvent itself with a new label for years. Um, Latino seemed to be, as Andrew has mentioned in the chat, seemed to be uh, the term to use. Uh, and it was it was preferred over Hispanic, which was uh, implemented by the Nixon administration in the 70s and was not embraced by the community. Um, there are people who would prefer Mexican American. There are people who prefer Chicano, right? Um, I'm, I'm not here to say one is better than the other. What I tend to do is to start with let Latinx or Latinx or in Spanish Latine. Right, it ends with an E, which is now something they've innovated in Spanish that makes grammatical sense uh, because the X does not make sense in Spanish as it's used there. Uh, and that's my starting point. And then if someone says, I prefer to be called Chicano, then I, 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 that's the word I use. So I think the X signals inclusivity uh, it signals, it's kind of like, it, it, is, it is almost how people use pronouns now. Uh, they announce pronouns uh, just as a measure of um, signification to show that the person is mindful of inclusiveness, um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. But I'm not here to change people's minds on what they should use. Uh, people should use what they want to use. That's how language works, and that's the beauty of language. Whereas Spanish is proscriptive, it is, it is uh, mandated from the highest authorities uh, in, in Spain as to what is a word and what is not a word and how it is used. English works the opposite way. It is, as we see every year, words are, new words are added to the dictionary. And how do they get there? Because people start to use them, right? So um, it is certainly, a uh, vexed issue. Uh, it is something that we won't uh, solve tonight. And, and I, I hope that's okay. Um, but I will say that, that I tend to use Latinx as a beginning point. And then I will go to things that I'm more comfortable with, or if someone that I'm speaking to signif you know, signals to me that they would prefer a different term than I use that. Fantastic. That's a really comprehensive answer. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you. So should I continue now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Let's see here. Um, my next slide is me. I thought this would be an opportunity to get a little chuckle. Um, there I am at, the, at a ledge in uh, the magnificent Grand Canyon. Um, I tend to do this to uh, annoy my wife. Um, I, I usually get close to the edge. It makes her really nervous. Um, and, but I, I had my daughter take this photo, and I was actually looking at this photo the other day, and I thought, you know what? This is a really interesting metaphor for what I do, right? I'm, I'm kind of at the edge of, you know, Latino, Latinx expression, representation, you know, why this community matters. Um, and at times, 
trying to talk about these issues, trying to teach and to educate and to understand feels like I'm at a precipice. It feels like I'm at an edge uh, and I have to be careful, but it also is a lonely place. And it is a place that is hard to get people uh, uh, comfortable with, right? This is, this, is a, this is a literal ledge. And so um, you know, knowing the ledge, is, uh, I think, a valuable bit of information here, a, a kind of a useful tip. But I think earlier in the chat, before we began, um, I think someone said, it was going by pretty fast, but I think someone said that the better question that began uh, the session uh, would have been, you know, how come there aren't more Latinx shows and movies? I'm going to talk about that in just a bit, but basically, um, we're talking about the humanities. We're talking about storytelling. We're talking about producing stories, directing stories, writing stories, which means that you have to, we have to have members of our own community that are not only doing these things, they move up into those positions of power. I call them gatekeepers, right? These are the positions of power that allow certain stories to be told and others to not be told. And, but this is also at a time where I often hear, you know, oh, don't get, an, uh, don't get a degree in creative writing or English, that's a useless degree. Um, and that, that bothers me as it should bother many people. But it, it bothers me in particular because I come from a historically marginalized group and then I'm being told, don't, don't pursue this. Don't be a writer. Don't be a storyteller. Don't be a filmmaker. Well, how are we going to get more Latinx films and television shows if we're not actively encouraging young Latinx students to pursue these creative arts? Uh, it, it, just, it seems to me um, just kind of baffling that on the one hand, some of us and not here, I'm not talking about anyone here tonight, but sometimes I hear, well, why aren't there more? But on the other hand, those who would go into these areas are actively discouraged because there's no, there's, they, they are told there's no money in it. Oh, it's too hard. Um, you know, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a bricklayer, be, be, be anything other than a creative writer. So uh, this, is, this is very frustrating. I think, and for all of us who are in here tonight, that's my exhortation to you. Encourage young talent. Don't discourage them, encourage them. Even when their family may say, no, don't be a writer, don't, don't pursue writing, don't pursue storytelling, um, why not, <laughs> right? This is, this, is, uh, this, is, this is at the heart of what I'm talking about. If we don't have directors, writers, producers, screenwriters, showrunners, who are of Latinx culture, um, we, we will continue to not see ourselves in these shows. It, it is quite literally that uh, simple. Uh, and, I, and, I'll, and I will talk more about that. But this idea of a ledge, like it's a dangerous place, but it's a place that some of us have to go. And you know, some of us have to do it. Those of you who are in here who are, who, who are, who are doing these things, uh, kind of at the front lines with the students, you're on a ledge too. And especially now at a time where it's politically popular to say we can't teach about race and ethnicity and diversity. It's particularly a struggle at this time to even get to the kind of things that I wanna talk about tonight. So a silly image of me, but hopefully one that sends home a message and something that you'll remember tonight after our time here. That, that you are on a precipice, you are on an edge, and you have to be aware of that. And you know, being in that place re requires care and it, and it requires you know, deliberate thought, but it's also, it can be a lonely place. And I, I am encouraged that there are so many people here tonight and that many of you hopefully have connected to others who are doing the same kind of work because it's just so difficult to do it alone. 
And so I wanted to thank you all. Um, I, for eight years, I was a high school English teacher uh, before I pursued uh, my graduate education. And so I, and my wife is a high school English teacher uh, right now. And so I, I have the utmost respect for what all of you do. So um, let's talk about uh, narrative, right? So, so this is a book that I co-authored with Frederick Luis Aldama. Um, and in it, we looked at representation in US film and television. Uh, this book won the International Latino Book Award uh, in 2020. I'm very proud of that. And I included the first chapter of this book as part of your reading. Um, and I encourage you to uh, seek out this book. It's not a very uh, long volume. It is written in a very reader friendly way. This is a great book for um, high school students and college students. It really is a as an opportunity to kind of catch up on the history of how we have been represented in these visual media forms. Um, and so I, I just want to briefly uh, talk about narrative. So one of the things that I do as a scholar is that I'm I'm really interested in how stories work. I'm really interested in narrative. Um, and so I have a couple of points here that I, I would like to emphasize. Uh, there's a tendency, and you probably have noted this, there's a tendency to repeat and retain certain narrative tropes and structures and forms due to past success or acclaim. So if we approach the question, why don't we see more films about or, or that feature Latinx characters or even actors? Like, like, why don't we see that? And in a moment, I'm gonna show you these numbers. But for now, let's just make that assumption, like, like just your own experience. You just don't see them as much as you probably should, right? So why is that? Well, storytelling in this nation has been and is a money-making endeavor. It is for profit. Um, novels are published to sell books. Uh, films are created to sell tickets. Uh, there's, there's just no other way around it. So the first thing we need to do is to understand that this is about making money. And for the longest time, we had, a, we had a large white demographic in this nation and, a, say, a small Latinx, Hispanic, Latino demographic. And so it was thought, who is buying these stories? Who is going to the films? Well, there was a time where it was mostly white audiences, mostly white readers. And so why would why would a publisher publish a novel by a Latino about Latinos for white audiences? Now, we could come up with reasons why they should, but the practical matter was they did not because they didn't see this as a viable market for these kind of stories. So this is a market issue. Ah, but things are changing. Latinos more and more are having uh, higher discretionary and disposable income. They are among the largest groups of moviegoers before COVID, right? And so, so like that, that fact is actually changing, but it hasn't caught up quite yet to those who are creating these, these stories in film and television and even in novels, right? And so what I'm saying there with that first point is, uh, uh, markets, and in particular, like this publishing market, it wants to repeat past success. It doesn't want to take a chance rarely on something. It wants return on investment. So if we make a story, if we, if we create a film, and it's a smash hit, well, guess what? We're going to have clones of that film over and over and over again, and maybe remakes. We'll have sequels. Right? They want to continue to profit on that one thing. So if, we, if, if overwhelmingly we have films about white people and they're successful because that's all there is, then there's, there's rarely going to be an opportunity for someone 
to come along and say, hey, well, why don't we make a film? But it's all about Latinos. Like the executives at movie studios will just shake their heads and say, that, that, that's like, why are we going to do that? We're just going to lose money. Right. So we have to recognize that that is one of the major obstacles and reasons why we do not have as many or as much representation as we likely should. Right. So that's the first thing. And as I, as I was mentioning, this tendency uh, creates a situation where it closes off other kinds of stories. Right. So. How does how do Latinos break into these stories? This is the <clears throat> this is the challenge. And over the history of filmmaking and the history of television in this country, it, it, has, it has it has been very exclusionary. And it has been very um, denigrating to Latinos, and it is only within the last few years where we started to see some change there, but where we are nowhere near where we should be. So this is, this is market driven, everybody. This is, this is capitalism uh, as, as, it, as it exists. Uh, now, I'm not here to bash capitalism, right? Uh, it has its critics, but I will say this is one outcome of a capitalistic uh, system because that's that's what we have with movies and with publishing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then finally, here uh, these are these are barriers of exclusion, right? It upholds the status quo. It squelches creativity, and it especially doesn't want to reach into a community that is underrepresented because it has no history in film. How is that going to make money? It's a huge risk, in other words. Right, so this is, sorry, take a drink of water here. This is the, this is the problem, <clears throat> right? Um, and, I, you know, uh, Armin, you know, says that representation is still lacking for minorities. That, that's, that, that, is, that is broadly the case. Tonight I'm speaking about Hispanic, Latinx representation, but non-majority um, communities. We, we could we could do this with with similar results to a lot of those communities as well. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I want to take a moment just to answer a question here by Robert, um, who wants to know about the um, objectification or commodification of inclusivity in the entertainment industry. Could you could it, and he's asking, could I speak more about my cynicism, optimism <clears throat> in light of this? Sorry, I have to drink some water. Sorry. It's okay. T take a moment and, and drink some water. And uh, again, Robert, thank you for uh, submitting that uh, question. Robert's from the Bank Street School in New York City. Um, while you take a, a drink, uh, Professor, I'll read it one more time. Robert's wondering if what you can share about your um, either your cynicism or optimism about the objectification and the commodification of inclusivity in the inter entertainment industry. Yeah, I think that actually aligns with what I was saying about return on investment. So let's say someone has a breakthrough film, right? Um, now suddenly, you know, the, the, say the film market reacts and it wants to make clones of that film. You know, just variations on the theme. Well, you know, if a particular film about someone who's crossing the border seems to be seems to do well monetarily, financially, well, let's do another one, right? And but then they can say, look, we're being inclusive. We we created another film that, or we created this film that's showing, you know, the plight of the border crosser or so forth. Um, it is, it is a very cynical take, right? Um, because they didn't care about it before. And then they only care about what was successful in the recent past. And in addition to that, what they end up doing is that the industry then creates so many of these that they become a stereotype. <clears throat> so you may remember early on tonight, I said that the immigration numbers are actually down, right? And that the US Latinos is actually much larger 
But you wouldn't know that by watching, you know, films that are they're coming out over the last couple of years. They're all about, you know, a border crosser, a coyote, or, you know, some white savior who's going to help this poor Latino boy or girl cross the border, right? It's like, it's almost as if that becomes the only story that can be told at that given time. Uh, so I think that is, uh, you know, kind of where the, where, the, where the cynicism toward inclusivity. If this were truly inclusive, we would get like a show about a Latino guy who was born in the United States and is like a nerd like in The Big Bang Theory. And he's not an immigrant and he's like, he's completely the opposite of what the stereotypes are for Latinos. Like that would be inclusivity, like, like showing many different iterations and expressions of identity and culture. But see, we don't get that. And when we do get that, it, it, it comes from people who are a part of the community, who are identified as Latinx. They're either the, the, the screenwriter, they're the showrunner, they're the director, they're the producer. And so we, again, we have to ask ourselves, how do you get to those positions of power, right? And I'm, I'm gonna talk about more of this uh, in just a bit, but I'm, I'm going to advance the slide um, because I know time is always the end of it. Yeah, it is, it is, Professor. And as, as the moderator, my job, unfortunately, is also be timekeeper. So I'll remind us we have about 35 minutes. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to talk briefly about something uh, that we call Latinx precarity. And precarity is just kind of a fancy term for, you know, being in a precarious situation, right? Um, so Judith Butler, some of you may recognize Judith Butler. She's a scholar who's really uh, changed uh, a lot of thinking on the particular gender, um, but, but other aspects of identity. <clears throat> and she has this essay, this wonderful essay that can be found called Performativity, which she was the innovator of that particular uh, concept, uh, and then Precarity and Sexual Politics. And I thought this quote really applies to, to this discussion. So her quote is, the politically induced, this is, this is what precarity is for her. The politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks of support and become differentially exposed to injury, violence, and death. This is, uh, this is applicable to many non-majority groups and identities in this country. But, it, but, but I see this as, as something, um, you know, part and parcel of being Latino, Latina, Latinx in the United States. Is, is like you're like you're always like potentially in danger um, b based on your identity, right? Uh, whether that's because there aren't social um, uh, kind of it, either innovations or, inter or or infrastructures there, or there there are de there are deliberate policies that prevent you from from um, you know having well being and having you know kind of what used to be called the American dream, which is the controversial topic, I think, at this and term at this time. Um, and I think that the idea of precarity is really important for us to understand when it comes to this um, the community that we're talking about this evening. So what does pre Latinx precarity look like? Um, it's divergent, diverse, and intersectional, right? So I think some of you have talked about this in the chat and in the questions, like Latinos, I'm gonna talk about this just a bit uh, in a moment. Latinos, they, we run the gamut of what we look like. Latinos can look Anglo. They can, with blonde hair, blue eyes, they can look uh, mestizo, right? They can be brown skin, brown eye, dark hair. They can look African, of African descent, they can they can be Afro Latino, um, and I and there are times where Latinos are of Asian descent, right? So th this this is a complicated issue, and maybe many folks who have who are tuning in tonight can can uh, 
if you can connect to this idea of at some times maybe being questioned, are you Latino? <laughs> like, are you Hispanic? Are you not? Like, like, because it's not immediately evident by what one looks like, right? So our precarity also is diverse, it's divergent. What, what puts me in a precarious situation may not be what puts you in a precarious situation, but it may all be tied to the idea that, that, that we belong to this particular community. Precarity may look passive, right? It may not look like anything is being done to a person or this community, but it is happening, right? Which is always a, kind of a difficult thing to come to terms with because you can't always prove it, you can't always show it. Precarity is, the te is tethered to systemic, social, and institutional policies that do not consider mitigating factors that disenfranchise Latinx people. A good example of that is something that I do in my work all the time is to remind the, re the, the people who recruit our students is to remind them that how they speak to and, and when, what they say and the information they give to Latinx parents and their children, it has to be different than, than say, white students. If you're, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not doing that, then you're just trying to apply something broadly to everyone, and that's not going to work. For example, at times, we at our university will bring groups of Spanish speakers, uh, uh, Spanish-speaking families to tour our campus. And what we found uh, as, uh, with the Latinx Cultural Center here, what we found is the script that the tour guides normally give was inadequate for our Spanish speakers. They wanted to know, how, is, how do I know my kid's going to be safe here? How, you know, where are they going to eat? You know, who's going to be there to help them? How, how can they stay in contact with me? Like, like these are the things that, that they uh, were, were um, that's, that's really what kind of was, what they were thinking about. And so that was a perfect example of how the university had kind of created a way of speaking to parents um, that, that they thought they could broadly apply to all. That did not work for this particular group. And, and so that's that situation where like, you have to consider how these things that are, that they seem like they apply to everyone, but they're systemic. And they're created in a way that doesn't consider the non-majority, if that makes sense. So um, it's the omission of representative examples of Latinx culture, could be folklore, narrative traditions, storytelling. This is precarity too. We don't see ourselves in, in mainstream media. And by media, I mean storytelling form. So television, film, and the like. It could be food scarcity, economic hardship, and precarity forces Latinx to give up on pursuits that are not immediately tied to the economic security of the family. So remember what I said earlier, if we want to see a change in the story that we see, we need to have more writers, more directors, more showrunners, more producers that are of Latinx heritage. But how are they going to do that if they have to worry about getting a job to support the family, right? So this is all of a piece. And people may wonder, well, because often I say, well, I study how Latinos are represented in film and for some, or even in comics. And some people are like, that doesn't sound like it's that serious. I'm making the case that it is very serious and it is very important and it is crucial to to this particular community's engagement with national conversations. Right now, we often feel like we're not a part of the conversation except when it is politically convenient and expedient. All right, so now kind of coming, coming home to the heart of my talk, uh, I'm gonna look at Latinx representation in film. A um, Couple of numbers here, just to put it in perspective, this is the USC Annenberg, uh, and the and NALIP, N A L I P, is the National Association of Latino Independent Producers. They did this study a few years ago um, to put it in perspective. So, of all of the characters that were that were investigated in over 1,200 films, that was over 47,000 characters. 
the overall average over an almost a little over 10 year span, 4.5% of all of the characters. Now keep in mind that Latinos comprise between 18 and 20% of our, of our national population, but they're only appearing as 4.5% of the characters. And this doesn't even talk about the kinds of characters that they're playing, right? So that's one set of data we should look at. Latino characters are invisible in film. This is a hundred of the top grossing films for the year 2018. And here are just raw numbers for you. There are, you know, 47 of them had any Latino character. 70, 70 of, the, of the films, so 70% had any Latina characters, right? Uh, uh, that is to say that they were invisible in that many. They were invisible in 95% of having any Latino characters with disability. So you see, as, as we go to the right, we're talking about identity as more intersectional, right? So, you know, Latino male, Latina, right, female, and then we have Latino character with disability, and we have uh, LGBTQ Latino character, almost completely missing from, uh, from, from the films that were investigated. A few Latino directors working on top grossing films. This is what I was mentioning before. Who's going to make these films? And who are the directors that are making these films? So out of 1,200 films, 4%, right? Few Latino producers work in film, this is 3%. So the producers, the people who are the gatekeepers, the people who have control of the strings of the decisions that are made, they don't, they are not a part of our, of, of our Latinx community, right? Just only rarely. And it is, um, it is a situation where they've had to work very hard to get into that situation. And it's, and it's, and it's a situation where the door closes behind them uh, once they're in. Uh, so one more slide of, of data here. Uh, so this is, this is what I'm talking about, you know, a pipeline to grow and develop for feature films. This is, this is what we need more of, right? Um, how do we create opportunities for Latinx storytellers to tell their stories, right? This is, this is, the, this is the heart of the matter. Um, and and, I'm, and I, I wish there was an easier answer, but we have to be intentional and it starts in schools, when we have a Latino, Latina child who, is, who seems to be adept at telling stories, who, who maybe write stories for fun, we have to encourage that, or we have to continue to do that, and to tell them it is okay to want to be a writer, because I guarantee you at home, they're probably not hearing that message. There's, 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 there's a really good chance that 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 is not even within kind of the realm of possibility for these young people. But that's where the directors are gonna come from. That's where the actors are gonna come from. So to continue here, uh, let me just back up just a bit here. Um, so you see, it's this 13% of international directors were Latino, 7% uh, were uh, of US directors were Latino, right? So. This is 29%, 71%, right? It's almost like, 20, you know, a quarter to, you know, the three quarters here. So I'm just going to give you an example here, just a, a very, you know, uh, visual one here. This is Alfonso Cuaron, right? He has he's won multiple Oscars. Um, he is not a U.S.-based Latino, right? He's, he's Mexican, right? And then we have Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro. Who also won for uh, Shape of Water. Um, he is he is also not a U.S. Latino. Um, we have Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu, who also is not from the United States, um, but he but he but all three of them are lumped in as like Latino directors, and they are once they're part of the U.S. culture, but they're not in the same category of kind of what we're talking about is like. Latinos who are based in the United States, kind of born and bred in the United States. So we're, we're, we, we have a further complicating issue here of international Latinos, which we had mentioned before when we're talking about Argentina and how language is used, and then like US, right? So Cuaron, Del Toro, Gonzalez Iñárritu, and then probably the most prominent 
U.S. Latino who is a director, a film director, is Robert Rodriguez. He has not won an Oscar. Uh, probably because he doesn't, that's not the kind of film that he does, right? He's really interested in these kind of um, romps, these kind of, you know, sci-fi, speculative kinds of things. He directed uh, an, ep an episode in the second season of The Mandalorian, which is why he's right there. Um, there are a few more prominent Latino directors based uh, that, that are born and kind of bred in the United States, but there are not many of them. So where is the PowerPoint? I, I, was having a, I was having a great conversation a while back with uh, Raul Gonzalez. Uh, he goes by Raul the Third. He's, a, he's, a, he's an illustrator and, a, and an artist for children's books, award-winning, great guy. And he asked me, where are, the, where are the U.S. Latino directors at? I said, well, there's Robert Rodriguez. He said, I know, but that was like, it was like in the 90s when, when, when Rodriguez created El Mariachi. But look how he did it. It's very well documented. He, he, he was at the University of Texas in the, in the film program, and he, uh, he basically rented the university, like the, like the, like the program's film cameras and he like borrowed them for a couple of days. He went close to the border and he shot a film. It's called El Mariachi. It's one of the great films. Uh, it's one of the great independent films of all time. You look at it and you can't believe the college student created that in just a couple of days with $7,000. But he is, an, he is an outlier. There are, there are not many people like him. And, but that's the question. Why aren't there more Latino, Latina, US-based Latino, Latina directors out there? Um, I think, you know, we're in the midst of a, of, a, of a change there, but it has been a long time coming there. So uh, in terms of speculative cinema, uh, I have already mentioned that um, Latinos come in all shapes, colors, sizes, um, and this, as you might imagine, makes it a difficult thing when you're watching a film, right? Like you don't know, un like unless you know the actor or actress, like, unless you know their identity and their heritage, you may not necessarily know that they are Latino. That's a difficult thing for representation, right? And I don't know how that is a problem that is solved, right? You know, they're not going to necessarily announce their identity in the film. It may not be evident in their in their surname. Um, it may not be evident in how they, you know, the color of their hair, the color of their eyes. So unlike the study of blackness in film, which in this nation we understand blackness as being, you know, it is a kind of a historical thing going all the way back to a, the one drop rule. We 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 can see blackness pretty evidently in, in film. We can't do so with Latinx identity. And that is something that is, uh, there's a problem that we face in terms of representation. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the speculative. Now, what do I mean by speculative? What I mean is um, what is often known as genre, um, um, Storytelling tends to fit under speculative, but it is thing. It is a it is an umbrella term where we would include sci-fi, fantasy, horror, uh, post-apocalyptic uh, stories, alternate realities. The, the, all of that fits under the speculative, and it's fascinating to me because that is the kind of storytelling that I think should be the most capacious. It should be the most open to identity because we're not bound to the rules of our society. We can imagine anything. And yet, right, and yet there is, there has been a tortured history of representation in speculative film. Right. So, um, I mean, if, I mean, I, I can go all the way back to a film uh, called uh, Fantastic Voyage. Right. And in this film, there are, you know, it, it, I don't know if you've ever seen the film, but basically the premise is they can like shrink 
this ship to like a microscopic size and they inject the ship into a person, right? And there's a particular mission that they're on. Well, Raquel Welch, who is Latina, she took on her maiden name because she thought that she would get she would get more roles if she had the last name Welch than if she had her Hispanic Spanish surname. And she's in the film, but there's no identifying marker that she's a Latina. And she's also like relegated to a role that is just like a helper. Like she's with all of these white men who are called doctor this, doctor that, and she's just a helper, beautiful woman there. Um, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like if they can shrink a ship to the size of a red blood cell, why can't they have Raquel Welch be a doctor who's a Latina, right? So like that's, that's a, a perfect example of what I'm talking about where like there's this irony uh, of the speculative. It should be a place where we could imagine anything and yet it has seemed for much of its history to replicate the kind of limitations we see in our society. So here are some recent examples of Latinos in speculative film. We have uh, Oscar Isaac there, who is Latino. He was in the kind of the newer Star Wars films. Um, and, but again, there's nothing in the character that's Latino because this is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. There are no Latinos there, right? But he embodies a Latino identity in, in our reality. Uh, Diego Luna, there is Cassian Andor in Rogue One. Uh, we also see uh, Zoe Saldana in Avatar and as Gamora in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Incidentally, she's painted, right? So you don't get to see the kind of the, her, her Afro-Latino roots and her brown skin. She's, she's, she's taken these roles sometimes where they kind of, they kind of mask um, one, one prominent feature of her Latinidad, right? Um, just a couple more. And, this is, and so the image on the left is an example of a film that is a wonderful um, expression of kind of what I'm talking about. This is uh, Into the Spider-Verse, animated film. And this is Miles Morales, right? He is, um, he is the Spider-Man in his universe. That comes directly from the comics. And it was controversial when it, when it, when it premiered, uh, well, when the character premiered in comics, it, it was uh, it was kind of hard to um, for some people to understand that Spider Man might look like this, but it is the particular expression of Latinidad. He he is he's is, he's is biracial in the film, and his father is is a is a black man, and so he is a, a really interesting expression. But this is this is recent, right? If we go back, we have Blade Runner, which is the the top right. Uh, image that's Edward James almost as a uh, he, he's Eduardo Gaff um, as a pretty important role. It's a small role, but he has an important role in Blade Runner. Um, and then below him we have Cesar Romero, who's the first Joker. Uh, this is from the television show. Um, Cesar Romero was uh, an actor who was typecast as a Latin lover for much of his uh, career. And um, but interestingly, he was. He was cast as the Joker. That's, but in, in his expression of that character, like he did not uh, kind of express any of his identity. He's acting as the Joker, right? But it, it, it presents an early uh, kind of curious situation where you have a Latino who's playing a character that is not supposed to be Latino. And this goes back to the early question that was posed to all of you. You know, should Latinos, Latinxes, be uh, relegated to only Latino roles? Um, the answer to that is, is no, because if they're only relegated to those roles, there aren't enough roles, right? I mean, we've already seen the numbers. Um, it's like less than 5% of the characters. So that means that Latinos are never going to have that opportunity. But we do have characters that have nothing um, in terms of like their connection to any particular identity. The Joker is one of them. Luke Skywalker is another one. There's nothing about the character that says they should be one ethnicity or race or the other. Um, it, but the casting decision is what really makes this um, what it is there. 
And then just three more quick images. Um, the Mandalorian actually has uh, Pedro Pascal, who is, the, he is the Mandalorian and he is Latino. Um, and he only takes off his, mat, his helmet once a season and you, and you get to see him. But otherwise, it's an interesting like situation where he's kind of hidden, like he has a hidden Latinidad. So even when we're on screen at times, you don't, you know, you don't really know that there's a Latino there until, you know, you find out who is, who is in the, who is in that particular character. Uh, the top right is a, is a wonderful independent film made years ago uh, by Alex uh, Rivera uh, called Fleet Dealer. And if it's a film that you have, if you haven't seen it, uh, you have to seek it out. It is, it is a, a small independent, uh, low budget film, but it really is timely even today. And I think does a really good job of showing how Latinx culture and identity can work really well in a, in a situation that has to do with a speculative environment. And then uh, Battle Angel Alita there, which is also directed by Robert Rodriguez. So there, there's some examples, and most of them are recent examples. And uh, I don't have enough time tonight to really go through all the different examples and kind of what they add up to, other than to say it's problematic. And if it's still a problem, I think we have to remind ourselves what we're seeing and, and that when we see a Latino or a Latina on screen, we have to celebrate that. We have to, we have to tell people to, you know, to, you know, support it um, because it's, it's all too easy for a, for a studio or a producer to say, well, let's cancel this or what have you. And then they won't do it again because of that return on investment um, paradigm that they're in. So, uh, real quickly, real quickly, Professor, and I, I apologize. We have again about 10, 10 or twelve minutes left. Uh, so, uh, concisely, I'll, I'll ask this question from Julia. Julia is joining us from Los Angeles Unified, and she's curious about your thoughts on non-Latinx actors filling specifically Latinx roles. Yeah, I, I understand how that can be a really uh, kind of problematic conversation to have. My personal opinion is um, that if it's a Latinx character, that it should be played by a Latinx person simply because there aren't enough roles as it is. Now, if there were, if there were a myriad of roles for Latinxes and like they just had so many to choose from, then we might have a conversation where we say, okay, now we're, we're you know, we, we can have this conversation, but um, there just aren't enough roles written uh, for for these actors in particular. So what they have to do is that they have to, you know, their their first opportunity is to play someone that they like, they they inhabit. If, if the character is a Latina uh, and they're a Latina actress, it seems natural that they would have that role. Um, this has happened. This has happened a lot. Um, I think the most prominent example that always comes to my mind is um, in the sequel to the film Alien. We call aliens plural, and there's a character there named Vasquez. That's also this what she's called, and she's a Latina, and she's like very strong, and she's like powerful, and she's like has a kind of an independent will, and she's a she's a very compelling character. But she's played by a Jewish white woman in brown face. They like put brown makeup on her and she's talking with kind of an accent. And, and so now she became a Latina and that's a, that's a disappointing thing. It's not to say she didn't do a good job as an actress, but the, the character was, was designed to be a Latina, right? So, so that's, uh, you know, it's certainly a problem. And so just kind of my take is, um, uh, I, th I think that every opportunity should be given for Latinxes to play Latinx characters. And if you don't do that, you, you're, you have to be prepared as a filmmaker to uh, receive the wrath of the community because we're going to ask the question, why? When there are so many talented actors and actresses who are, who are just you know, trying to break through, and yet for whatever reason, you have decided this other person is going to, this person who is not Latinx, is going to play that role um yeah so yeah it's, it's great and i i know i'm going to put you uh, i'm going to squeeze you here professor because again our time is running uh, short however raquel mendoza just asked the question that i think is 
a nice um, uh, uh, third question in this kind of series of, of narrative that you're discussing. Um, she notes that in the film, A Beautiful Mind, the wife of the main character is Latina in real life, but Hollywood eliminated that character. Do you have some thoughts about that, uh, the role of Hollywood in that sense? Yeah, um, I, I, I think uh, it has to do with filmmakers and studios thinking about their audiences and their audiences must be white as how they imagine them. And that it perhaps would be too controversial, too complicated to have to explain this. Um, and so they make changes and we see this all the time, you know, this is based on a true story, but they create characters, they change their identities, they do all sorts of things. And they do it because I think they have a very narrow conception of who's watching the film. And that's why I was saying earlier, I think, I think, you know, the message is going to hit home very soon that um, Latinos are are making up a large portion of the people who watch these films. They are the ones who are paying to go to the movies and to, and to watch uh, these products. And if they're upset with this kind of uh, uh, representation, um, they're not going to give their money to it, right? And ultimately, that's what changes things for popular media. When you stop buying certain things, you stop buying tickets, you stop buying someone's uh, CD or their music, or you stop um, you know, streaming a particular show, uh, people notice that. And it forces them to have uncomfortable conversations. Um, uh, that's my timer. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm about out of time here. If I could just, just finish on this point here about narrative permissibility, something that I've Please been uh, kind of harping on, um, you know, is the book that I wrote, narratives can flourish in the minds of audiences only if they are deemed permissible. And I think that's the other side of that question. Is it permissible that John Nash had a, a wife of color? Oh, well, for some audiences, that's, that's, that's going to be too much for them to even imagine. So let's just eliminate it. Let's just change that, right? So, you know, this, this idea of permissibility uh, really permeates storytelling. Who can tell stories? Um, whose stories are, are exalted and whose stories are silent. Um, and unfortunately, I, I come back to where I began. It has to do with market, it has to do with money, it has to do with clicks, it has to do with streams. It, it, is, it, is, it is all of a piece. And if we want control, we can do two things. We can encourage our young uh, creative minds to, to take these paths. And then the other thing we can do is that we can control where our money goes and what we support and what we don't support, uh, which is basically the next slide here, which has to do with, you know, um, how how this idea of permissibility works, uh, and who can who can write these stories, and, and how the market shapes that. I'm going to kind of just I'll leave this for anyone who wants to look at the slides. Uh, this idea of persisting. It's kind of what I just said is that we have to continue to to push where we can, um, and uh, and 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 to not give up, right? So finally, my final slide here: um, this, this idea of persistence of effort. It's not a question of if; it is a matter of when. It's it's not if we're going to matter as Latinx is, or as a Latinx community. It's, it's like when will we achieve critical mass where we can no longer be ignored? Um, we do have a kind of precarity. And that is tied to how we are represented and the lack of representation. Um, we have a more difficult time gaining permissibility and telling our stories. That affects how we're in this situation of precarity. But it also can be changed um, when there's a breakout story, when there's a breakout performance, we have to support it and we have to kind of put all hands on deck to make sure that the world and in particular, the nation that we live in pays attention to that. And then, of course, speculative, speculative cinema is where that's happening in really interesting ways now, even though its history is not very um, uh, inclusive. You've given us a lot to think about tonight, Professor. I've, I've got a couple of questions from our audience uh, as we draw to a conclusion. Uh, I will note, by the way, Chris, that you totally outed yourself generationally when you mentioned CDs. Uh, I know, I know, I know. What are you doing with the I CDs? Um, 
<laughs> uh, I'm going to bring this question from Raina. Raina is a, uh, a loyal um, attendee of our webinar series, and uh, he asks if you think the Latinx community is ready for the change that you're endorsing. Uh, if Latinx community is the one paying for it, do you think it's ready to be given up entertained if Hispanics are not being represented? Um, that's a that's a tough question because I I don't I don't know as a community uh, whether whether we're ready to do that or not. I do know that we are em more and more we're empowered to do that. Uh, you know, we as I said, you know. Um, we tend to have more money to spend. This is documented. We tend to go to movies more um, uh, in, in, well, at least in greater numbers. Um, and, but on the other hand, I'll, I'll just tell a story about like my own upbringing. I mentioned that I was keenly aware that people who looked like me and sounded like my family didn't appear in our film. But for my family, they didn't care. If they wanted to see Latinos, they would watch you know something on Telemundo, or they would watch you know Univision, or they would watch you know some Vicente Fernandez film, or you know whatever. And like they were okay with that. But I think more and more, I I I I feel like we we get a thrill out of seeing ourselves on the screen. Now the question is, have we become so kind of like numbed by the fact that we never see ourselves that we're okay with never seeing ourselves. I don't feel like I can endorse that. I think that perhaps we all want would you know get a thrill to see ourselves represented. And so um, yeah, I think it's there. I, I think you know we're at a crossroads, and I think we're starting to see some of that movement, and that's why we're getting more and more diverse representation uh, in these in these um, storytelling media. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, last question, Chris. Um, I'm going to actually ask this myself. You know, the the other way that we represent and um, and celebrate different identities is through the curriculum choices that we make. And so, all of the educators, regardless of the level, uh, as educators, we make choices of uh, the materials and the resources and the stories and the narratives that we share with our students. I'll put you on the spot a little bit. You're a professor of English. Are there particular um, uh, books or stories or films or in terms of making those curricular choices, are, are there any that you would recommend to our audience that are really good to be to include and will be inclusive? Yeah, um, I, th I think uh, it kind of depends on the media. Like if you're if you're interested in storytelling, um, we have some writers who are who have been around for a while and they're still doing great great work. That's someone like Sandra Cisneros, right? I mean, she's like mm -hmm. this really important um, Chicana writer, and she's still writing and she's writing for younger audiences all the time. Um, and, but we have you know newer um, you know kind of newer to the scene writers. I, I think um, uh, Manuel Gonzalez is doing a really good job with this, with a short story. Um, but here's the here's the other here's the caveat I will I will put out there. Um, a lot of times, writers who are Latino like Latinx uh, heritage, they're writing about things that might not necessarily be, you know, classroom friendly, and that's a very difficult thing for us because um, many of the writers are writing about things that they experienced growing up. Well, maybe they grew up in a, in a in a home where you know things weren't always you know nice, and they lived in a tough neighborhood. Sometimes those are things that are frowned upon in terms of what um, what educators are able to bring into the classroom. So that, so there are some challenges there, but um, I think in terms of I well I actually think in terms of of visual storytelling, um, there there are there are comics, there are there are superhero comics. There's a there's a really wonderful comic called Quince that I would I would recommend. Uh, of course, it's you know um, acknowledging a quinceanera, but um, there 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 are uh, there's just a a great um, a flourishing of Latinos in comic books and comic book storytelling. Uh, I, uh, there's there's probably too much to kind of name here. And then just in terms of film and in terms of, 
uh, shows that it seems like um there 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 are more and more uh, films that are um uh doing really interesting things with representation on the other hand there are really bad examples so um yeah, yeah i i think i would just say if you if you look at the book that aldama and i wrote uh real latinx is i think if you check that book out we kind of run through the gamut of of films and shows that really give you history and and a lot of recent stuff, but also a lot of historical films that, that give you good context there. Fantastic, thank you for answering that. And of course, uh, what I was also doing uh, and seemed to work is encouraging the audience to drop in titles and authors and suggestions in the chat box. I would encourage uh, everyone to cut and paste, do a quick grab of all of those suggestions because uh, they, they also address the same question. Uh, Professor yeah, Gonzalez, I, yeah, I, think said, I think someone said "Love and Rockets." Um, yeah. that was going to be a tough one to bring into the classroom. I guarantee you. Uh, but, true. Uh, great, great work, uh, Professor. Thank you again for joining us tonight, for sharing your insights, and for your good work at the Latinx Cultural Center. Uh, Chris, I hope we can uh, work together again soon. Great. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I hope that you follow the National Humanities Center on our Twitter feed and other social media, as well as check out our website and the digital library for announcements and new opportunities. Uh, we've got them all the time, and I'm hopeful that you'll be able to join us for future sessions of our webinar season. That includes our next one. We're scheduled for October 26th. That's next Tuesday, uh, positioned right before the Halloween uh, weekend. We'll be joined by Michelle Brock. She's a professor of Associate Professor of History at Washington Lee University in Virginia. Her topic will be Speak of the Devil, Teaching Histories of the Supernatural. Thank you again for all the work that you do. Have a great day at school tomorrow and for the rest of the week. I hope to see you next time on the Humanities of Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.